Access your free language gifts of the month right now. Here's what you're getting this month. First, the making a phone call cheat sheet. Want to be able to talk on the phone in your target language? Then this conversation cheat sheet will help you do just that. You'll learn all the basic phrases, questions, and answers you'll need when making a call. Second, want to know the learning hacks, motivational tips, and success strategies for learning a language in 2020? Then you'll want this exclusive 52-page ebook. Download it now for free before we take it down. Third, words and phrases for the dentist. Learn how to schedule a checkup, talk about a toothache, and much more with this one-minute vocab lesson. Fourth, can you talk about your zodiac sign? Then this next one-minute lesson is for you if you want to learn. You'll learn how to say the 12 signs in your target language. Fifth, the 32 words you'll need for language learning. Noun, verb, adjective, sentence, grammar. Can you say these in your target language? If not, you'll want this quick one-minute lesson. Sixth, free audiobooks for our members only. Unlock our huge library of language learning audiobooks. Save them to your device and listen and learn. They're yours to keep forever. And finally, the deal of the month. If you want to finally master the language with lessons by real teachers and our complete language learning program, take the 12 month challenge and get 12 months of premium or premium plus at up to 45% off. So to get your gifts and language learning resources, click the link in the description below. Download them right now before they expire. Hi guys, welcome back to Italian Pod 101. My name is Desiree, mi chiamo Desiree, but you can call me Daisy. Ma potete chiamarmi Desi. And in this video we're gonna learn together numbers in Italian. I numeri. I numeri. For the first 10, the most important ones, I'm gonna try to give you examples or anyway way of sayings in order for you to remember them in an easier way. First of all, we have uno, uno, which is one, as in like, say il numero uno. You are in the number one, like you're the best. Due, due, two, a thing that Italians like a lot, chatting. Fare due chiacchiere. Literally, to have two chats basically means to chit chat, so to talk a bit, hopefully in front of a coffee. And then, of course, Non c'è due senza tre. There is no two without three. So tre is three. Quattro. Quattro. If you remember two, due, with due chiacchiere, then add fare due chiacchiere a quattro occhi. Quattro occhi. So four eyes, right? Means let's talk, just me and you. A quattro occhi. Five, cinque, let's say the five senses, i cinque sensi. The hardest thing to pronounce in this word is que, cinque, because there's the mm. You have to stop a moment before adding que, because otherwise cin cinque, cinque, no. Cinque, take your time to pronounce it slowly, and then it will come more natural. Say six is what high school students want. Because in Italy, six is what you need to pass an exam, which is evaluated on a scale out of ten. Sette, sette, seven. We say sudare sette camice, so to sweat seven shirts, means that you're really trying and that you're really, really putting effort into it. And then we have otto, otto. If you remember quattro, which is four, we say fare in quattro e quattro otto, which means to do something in a really quick way. It's something really fast. Quattro e quattro otto, literally four and four, eight. Quattro e quattro otto. Nove. Mm, il lavoro inizia alle nove. Because usually that's when people start working in the offices, right? Nove, nine. And then we have dieci, ten. Dieci. Let's see, Italy, soccer, there's the goalkeeper, and dieci giocatori, ten players, dieci. Now, dieci is a really important sound to remember, even if you don't remember how to say that, when you hear that, you know that it has something to do with numbers from 10 to 19. 
because in the next nine numbers too, even if you don't hear the word dieci, there is dici or dicha, which means it has something to do with dieci. In fact, for 11, the word is undici, undici. Then we have dodici, dodici, 12. 13 is tredici, tredici, quattordici, 14, quattordici, 15 is 15, this Q is again like in 5, it's in 15 too, 15, 16, 16, 16. Until this point, the part that refers to 10 was at the end of the word, but from 17 to 19, it shifts to the beginning. So, 17, 17, it's 17. 18, 18. It's 18 and 19, 19 is 19. And as I said till here, you probably just have to learn them by heart. But from now on, things get easier. So breathe again, it's gonna be better because <laughs> we have 20, 20 as 20. From there on, you just add one of the decimal numbers that you already know. So, 20 and 1 becomes 21. Just because when we have two vowels together, one goes away, right? So, 20 and 1 becomes 21. But then, you just say 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. Then again, with otto, which starts with a vowel, is ventotto, all together. So not venti and otto, but ventotto. And then ventinove. And you can work with this with the next numbers too. Like 30 is trenta, trenta. Be careful with 33, because it gets tricky, is trenta tre, trenta tre. 40 is quaranta. 40, and it's easy to remember that it comes from 4, right? 4 becomes 40, while 5 becomes 50. So 51, 52, and so on. Then we have 60 for 60. 60. I know this is a, a bit tricky, but you just have to stop the s sound for a bit. 60. 60 and 70, 70. So in this case, it's not double S, but S and T. 70, 70. 80 is 80. It's easy to see that it comes from 8, 80. And 90 is 90. So from 9, which is 9, 90. And with hundreds too, it's easy. Because once you know cento, which is a hundred, be careful because in Italian we don't say un cento, we just leave it as it is, cento, hundred. Then you just add the number, cento uno, cento due, cento venti, cento trenta sei. I'm just giving numbers here. And that's an important expression because in Italian when you say dare i numeri, so basically to say numbers, to tell numbers, to give numbers, literally, it means that you're a bit crazy, because uh, you don't really know what you're saying. And here I'm just giving numbers, I'm just going out of my mind with random numbers. With the last number, mille, thousand, mille. Again, we don't say one thousand, but just mille, while if you want to say two thousand, then it's due mila. Hi everyone, welcome back to Italian Pod 101. My name is Desi, mi chiamo Desi, and in this video I'm gonna teach you the days of the week in Italian. I giorni della settimana. I giorni della settimana. Where giorni is days and week is settimana. The days of the week in Italian, like in some other languages as well, take their name from planets. 
So an easy way to remember the days of the week is to think about planets. Don't think about the correct order though, because it's not the real one, okay? Let's start with Monday. It takes its name from la luna, which is the moon, lunes in Latin, and it becomes lunedì. Lunedì. Keep in mind that di means day, so you will encounter this ending of the word for many of the days, not all of them, but almost. Okay, let's imagine a schedule for the week so that we can have some examples. And let's say that il lunedì ho lezione di italiano. On Mondays I have Italian classes. Il lunedì ho lezione di italiano. Invece, while, il martedì vado in palestra. On Tuesdays I go to the gym. If you don't add il and just say martedì vado in palestra, we assume that you're going to the gym this Tuesday, but not every Tuesday. Instead, if you say il martedì vado in palestra, it implies that you go every Tuesday. Martedì comes from Marte, so Mars. Martedì. Then we have mercoledì from Mercury, Mercurio. Mercoledì, mercoledì. Mercoledì esco con le amiche. Wednesday I'll go out with my girlfriends. Or con gli amici, with my friends. Giovedì mi riposo. On Thursday I'll rest. Giovedì comes from Giove, so Jupiter. Giovedì. And then it comes what we all are in love with. Venerdì. Venerdì. From Venere, so Venus. Friday. Friday I'll go to the cinema. Venerdì andrò al cinema. Or il venerdì vado al cinema. If you go every Friday. So till here, ending with di, we have lunedì, martedì, mercoledì, giovedì, and venerdì. The five days of the week. Then it comes the weekend, and we have Saturday, sabato, Sabato. Here there are many theories. So some people say it comes from the sun or just from Sabbatic, which is the Hebraic etymology. So let's just think about the planets from Monday till Friday, okay? From lunedì to venerdì. Then just remember Sabato, as it is, and Domenica too. Domenica is Sunday. Domenica. Il sabato faccio le pulizie. On Saturdays I clean or sabato vado a fare la spesa. On Saturday I buy groceries, while domenica dormo tutto il giorno. I sleep all day long. Dormo tutto il giorno. Some other words that are useful when talking about the days of the week are oggi, so today. Oggi è domenica. Today is Sunday. Domani, tomorrow. Domani. Domani è lunedì. Domani è lunedì. While ieri era sabato. Ieri, yesterday. Ieri era sabato. If you want to say the day after tomorrow is dopo domani. Easy. Dopo means after and domani is tomorrow. So after tomorrow as in English, dopo domani. Dopodomani è martedì, while the day before yesterday is not prima ieri, well, prima is before, but we say l'altro ieri, so the other yesterday, kind of like the other day, l'altro ieri. Also, when talking about days of the week, if you want to specify if it's this week or next one or the last one that just passed, we say questo martedì, this Tuesday, actually it's correct to say next Tuesday, il prossimo martedì, because it has to come, right? But in the spoken language we say this Tuesday, questo martedì, for the one that is the closest to us, while we refer to the one that is coming up next, so next week, as il prossimo martedì, the next Tuesday, which is not next as the first one that comes, but the first one that comes after the one that is closest to me. <laughs> I know it sounds confusing, but it's not. We have questa settimana, so this week, 
with questo martedì, questo mercoledì, questo giovedì. So this Tuesday, Wednesday or Thursday. And next Tuesday, next Wednesday, next Thursday. So il prossimo martedì, prossimo mercoledì, prossimo giovedì. While if we are talking about Tuesday last week, then is lo scorso martedì. Scorso. And you can use scorso, which literally means past, with the week too. La scorsa settimana. Last week. This week, questa settimana, and next week, la prossima settimana. For example, we're meeting for our Italian lessons on Monday, and I say, lo scorso lunedì, la lezione è stata molto interessante. Last Monday, the lesson was really interesting. Lunedì prossimo non faremo lezione perché è festa. Next Monday we won't have a lesson because it's a holiday. È festa. It's a holiday. So yeah, use the time to study. <laughs> I'm kidding. Let me know what are your plans for next Thursday. Cosa fai il prossimo giovedì? Cosa fai il prossimo giovedì? What are you doing next Thursday? Hi guys, welcome back to Italian Pod 101. My name is Daisy, mi chiamo Daisy, and in this video we're gonna learn together about nationalities. La nazionalità. La nazionalità. Nazione is country, so nazionalità is where you come from. Nationality. First of all, let's say that we can't cover them all. So I'm sorry if yours is not included in the video, but don't hesitate to comment and ask about that. And also I'm gonna try to give examples just for the sake of grammar. So don't focus on the content, hopefully it's correct, but if not, please focus on the grammar, okay? That being said, I'm gonna use examples with food, so it's easy to remember, at least for people like me who really like to eat. And of course, let's start with Italian. So. La pizza è italiana. Pizza is Italian. We can't argue about this, can we? As other adjectives in Italian, nationalities too have to be adjusted based on the subject. La pizza è italiana ends with A because la pizza is female. La pizza. If I say Marco è italiano, then you can see that since Marco is a male, italiana becomes italiano. And also some of them don't even change, but we're gonna get to that in a bit. For now, let's see some other examples of this normal form that changes according to the subject. So from Italia, we have italiano or italiana. Then let's say la paella è spagnola. La paella è spagnola. I want you to focus on the name of the country too, so let's work in a parallel way, okay? Spain is Spagna. And Spanish is spagnolo or spagnola. La paella è spagnola. Juan è spagnolo. Juan is Spanish. Il kebab è turco. Il kebab è turco. Kebab is Turkish. Turchia is the name for the country. Turchia, turco. Or turca. Le piramidi sono egiziane. Pyramids are Egyptian. Le piramidi sono egiziane. Here I want you to notice that it's not only about she or he, but also about singular or plural, right? So piramidi, which is female and plural, goes with egiziane, while lui, he, is lui è egiziano. Lei è egiziana. She is Egyptian. And by the way, Egypt is Egitto. Egitto. Same works, for example, for Svizzero. L'orologio è Svizzero. The watch is Swiss. Fun thing in this case is that the name of the country is the same as the female version of Swiss. So, Svizzera, lui è Svizzero, he is Swiss, or she is Svizzera. Svizzeri and Svizzere. This can be tricky, this Svizzere. Hope you're not from there because it's hard to say, <laughs> I'm kidding. Then we have lo yogurt è greco. 
Lo yogurt è greco. From Grecia. Grisland. Grecia. Lui è greco. Lei è greca. Be careful because they are greci. But they, female, are greche. Greche. Lo strudel è tedesco. If you don't know, it's a sweet with apples. Very, very nice. Lo strudel è tedesco. From Germania, which is Germany. This is really tricky because it completely changes. If you're from Germania, which is Germany, you are tedesco or tedesca. And then we have tedeschi or tedesche. Il curry è indiano. Curry is Indian. From India. Indiano. Easy. Same goes, for example, for America and Americano. L'hamburger è americano. Hamburger is American. But here, to be precise, we're talking about the continent, America. While if you want to refer specifically to USA, it's Stati Uniti, United States, Stati Uniti. It's part of the group of those adjectives that don't change. Of course, they do change if it's singular or plural, but not if it's male or female. For example, lei è statunitense. She is from the US. Lui è statunitense. He is from the US. Loro, they, sono statunitensi. It changes only if the subject is plural, okay? In the same group, we also have France, for example, Francia. La baguette è francese. Baguette is French. Baguette, by the way, is female. So it's like saying, lei è francese. She is French. But even if I say, lui è francese, francese doesn't change. While loro, they are francesi. Loro sono francesi. They are French. And even if it's just a group of female friends, for example, loro sono francesi. I ravioli sono cinesi. Dumplings are Chinese. From China, which is China. Cinesi. Or cinese, if singular. Le polpette sono svedesi. Meatballs are Swedish. I know they're not, but they're really famous there, right? So, svedese comes from Svezia, which is Sweden. Swedish is svedese. Lui è svedese, lei è svedese. Io sono svedese. It's not true. <laughs> Giappone, giapponese. Il sushi è giapponese. Sushi is Japanese. Lei è giapponese. She is Japanese. La birra è irlandese. Beer is Irish. Irlanda is Ireland. So, irlandese is Irish. Of course, there are many others, but this is more or less how it works, grammar-wise. I'm so sorry if I didn't mention your nationality, but there are just too many and this video would never end if we did then. So... Ciao a tutti! Sono Felice Angelini. Hi everyone, I'm Felice Angelini. In this lesson, you learn how to talk about your occupation in Italian. This is Mark Lee, and he's on a plane to Italy. He asks the passenger sitting next to him, Paolo Parisi, Are you a student? È studente? Listen to the conversation and focus on Paolo's response. Note, the speakers in this conversation use formal Italian. Ready? È studente? No, non sono studente. Sono investitore. Once more with the English translation. È studente? Are you a student? No, non sono studente. Sono investitore. No, I'm not a student. I'm an investor. Let's take a closer look at the conversation. Do you remember how Mark asks, Are you a student? È studente? First is, È. You are when using formal Italian. È. È. Note, 
え。is a shortened form of。れいえ。you are。in Italian。れい。you。when using formal Italian。can be omitted when it is understood from context。え。is from the verb。essere。meaning。to be。essere。Next is. Studente. Student. Studente. Studente. In Italian, all nouns have grammatical gender and are either singular or plural. Studente. Is masculine singular. Altogether. E studente. Are you a student? E studente. Now, let's take a closer look at the response. Do you remember how Paolo says, No, I'm not a student, I'm an investor? No, non sono studente, sono investitore. First is the expression, No, meaning no. 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 It answers Mark's yes or no question Are you a student? A student. After this, Paolo specifies that he's not a student. Non sono studente. I'm not a student. Non sono studente. First is. Non. Not. Non. Non. Next is. Sono. I am. Sono. Sono. Note here. Sono. Is a shortened form of. Io sono. I am. In Italian. Io. I is usually omitted as it's understood from context. Sono. Is from the verb. Essere. Meaning to be. Essere. Together, it's. Non sono. Literally, not I am, but it translates as I'm not. Non sono. Next is. Studente. Student. Studente. Altogether. Non sono studente. I'm not a student. Non sono studente. Paolo then tells Mark his actual occupation. Sono investitore. I'm an investor. Sono investitore. First. Sono. I am. Sono. Next is. Investitore. Investor. Investitore. Investitore. The word. Investitore. Is masculine singular. Together. Sono investitore. I'm an investor. Sono investitore. Altogether. No, non sono studente. Sono investitore. No, I'm not a student. I'm an investor. No. Non sono studente, sono investitore. The pattern is. No, non sono. Occupation. Sono. Actual occupation. No, I'm not occupation. I'm actual occupation. No, non sono. Occupation. Sono. Actual occupation. Imagine you're Emma Esposito, a student. The word for a female student is. Studentessa. 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 Paolo Parisi asks you if you're a teacher. Insegnante. 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 Say. No, I'm not a teacher. I'm a student. Ready?
No, non sono insegnante. Sono studentessa. No, I'm not a teacher. I'm a student. No, non sono insegnante. Sono studentessa. In Italian, some occupations have the same word for both genders. For example, Insegnante 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 However, much of the time, words will differ depending on gender. In general, nouns that end in O tend to be masculine, while nouns that end in A tend to be feminine. Let's look at some more examples. Listen and repeat, or speak along with the native speakers. No, non sono studente. Sono investitore. No, non sono studente. Sono investitore. No, non sono insegnante. Sono studentessa. No, non sono insegnante. Sono studentessa. No, non sono insegnante. Sono ingegnere. No, non sono insegnante. Sono ingegnere. No, non sono infermiera. Sono medico. No, non sono infermiera. Sono medico. No, non sono studente. Sono insegnante. No. Non sono studente, sono insegnante. No, sono barista. No, sono barista. Did you notice how the last speaker omits part of the response? No, sono barista. No, I'm a barista. No, sono barista. When directly responding to someone's question, it's often possible to omit part of the response. Here, by simply answering No. No, there's no need to say Non sono studentessa. I'm not a student. This pattern is No, sono Actual occupation. No, I'm actual occupation. No, sono actual occupation. You should be aware of this, but for this lesson, we'll use the pattern. No, non sono occupation. Sono actual occupation. No, I'm not occupation. I'm actual occupation. No, non sono occupation. Sono actual occupation. Let's review the key vocabulary. Student. Studente. Studente. Studentessa. Studentessa. Insegnante. Teacher. Insegnante. Insegnante. Ingegnere. Engineer. Ingegnere. Ingegnere. Nurse. Infermiere. Infermiere. Infermiera. Infermiera. Medico. Doctor. Medico. Medico. Barista. 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 Let's review. Respond to the prompts by speaking aloud. Then repeat after me, focusing on pronunciation. Ready? Do you remember how Paolo says investor? 
investitore, investitore. And how Paolo says, I'm an investor. Sono investitore. Sono investitore. Do you remember how Paolo says, student? Studente. Studente. And how to say not. Non. Non. Do you remember how Paolo says, I am not a student? Non sono studente. Non sono studente. Do you remember how Paolo Parisi says, I am not a student, I am an investor? Non sono studente, sono investitore. Non sono studente, sono investitore. Do you remember how Mark Lee asks, Are you a student? Remember, Mark uses formal Italian. È studente? È studente? Do you remember the word for a female student? Studentessa. Studentessa. And the word for teacher. Insegnante. Insegnante. Do you remember the word for engineer? Ingegnere. Ingegnere. Let's practice. Imagine you're Mark Lee and you're an engineer. Respond to Paolo's question. Ready? È insegnante? No, non sono insegnante, sono ingegnere. Listen again and repeat. No, non sono insegnante, sono ingegnere. No, non sono insegnante, sono ingegnere. Let's try another. Imagine you're Felice Angelini and you're a teacher. Ready? È studente? No, non sono studente, sono insegnante. Listen again and repeat. No, non sono studente, sono insegnante. No, non sono studente, sono insegnante. Let's try one more. Now imagine you're Emma Esposito and you're a student. Ready? È insegnante. No, non sono insegnante. Sono studentessa. Listen again and repeat. No, non sono insegnante. Sono studentessa. No, non sono insegnante, sono studentessa. We've found that the best way to learn a language is to speak it from day one. And the best way to start speaking is to learn phrases that you'll use in real conversations. Today, we'll learn conversational phrases about occupations. 
After watching this video, you'll be able to talk about your job and ask what somebody does for a living. And if you want to learn more vocabulary, phrases, and example sentences you can use in real life situations, click the link in the description to download your occupation PDF cheat sheet for free. Now, let's take a look at some conversational phrases. Listen to the dialogue. Che cosa fai? Sono un artista. Listen to it again, now with the English translation. Che cosa fai? What do you do? Sono un artista. I'm an artist. First of all, you need to learn how to say, What do you do? That's... Che cosa fai? Listen to it again. Che cosa fai? Che cosa fai? Now, how do you answer this question? This is the pattern you'll need. Sono un... uno... Your occupation. I'm a... an... Your occupation. For example, I'm an artist. Sono... un artista. Sono un artista. Here are a few more professions you can use with the same pattern. Police officer. Ufficiale di polizia. Ufficiale di polizia. Teacher. Insegnante. Insegnante. Doctor. Dottore. Dottore. Dottoressa. Dottoressa. Engineer. Ingegnere. Ingegnere. Now, listen to some examples. Che cosa fai? Sono un insegnante. Che cosa fai? Sono un dottore. Che cosa fai? Sono un ingegnere. Ok, now it's your turn. Do you remember how to say, what do you do? Che cosa fai? Imagine you're a doctor. Do you remember how to say, doctor? Dottore. Dottore. Say, I'm a doctor. Sono un dottore. Now answer the question saying that you are a doctor. Che cosa fai? Sono un dottore. Now, imagine you're a teacher. Do you remember how to say teacher? Insegnante. Insegnante. Say, I'm a teacher. Sono un insegnante. Now, answer the question saying that you are a teacher. Che cosa fai? Sono un insegnante. Now, imagine you're an engineer. Do you remember how to say engineer? Ingegnere. Ingegnere. Say, I'm an engineer. Sono un ingegnere. Now, answer the question saying that you are an engineer. Che cosa fai? Sono un ingegnere. Well done! In this lesson, you learn new occupation-related vocabulary and phrases you can use in your everyday life. 
you are now able to talk about your job like a native speaker. In this video, you'll have a chance to test them out with a quiz. First, you'll see an image and hear a question. Next comes a short dialogue. Listen carefully and see if you can answer correctly. We'll show you the answer at the end. Are you ready? Un insegnante sta parlando con degli studenti. Che cosa porteranno con loro gli studenti? Domani visiteremo un museo. Portate con voi una penna, un taccuino e qualcosa da bere. Pranzeremo nel ristorante del museo, quindi non c'è bisogno di portare panini. Dobbiamo portare l'ombrello? Potrebbe piovere, portatelo. Va bene. Che cosa porteranno con loro gli studenti? Un insegnante sta parlando con degli studenti. Che cosa porteranno con loro gli studenti? Domani visiteremo un museo. Portate con voi una penna, un taccuino e qualcosa da bere. Pranzeremo nel ristorante del museo, quindi non c'è bisogno di portare panini. Dobbiamo portare l'ombrello? Potrebbe piovere, portatelo. Va bene. Want more Can Do Series videos? Go to italianpod101.com to be the first to know when new videos are released. You learn practical conversations in every lesson so that by the end, you can do it. You can give a self-introduction. You can talk about where you're from. Sign up for a free lifetime account right now. It takes less than 30 seconds. Just click the link in the description to sign up and start learning in seconds. Your condition is not getting better, and you decide to go to the nearby clinic. You receive a medical report. What is the diagnosis? You receive a medical report. What is the diagnosis? The diagnosis is Food poisoning caused by contaminated food. Intossicazione alimentare causata da cibo contaminato. You just bought a few items from a local shop online. What information does the website say about the delivery date? What information does the website say about the delivery date?
The website says that delivery dates differ depending on the delivery method, but all dates should be calculated from the next working day. Le date di consegna variano a seconda del metodo di consegna, ma tutte le date devono essere calcolate a partire dal giorno lavorativo successivo. Most people don't like to hear this, but consistent hard work is one of the biggest factors in your language learning success. The course or method you choose makes a difference too, but at the end of the day, you ride or die by the work you put in. The quantity of time spent studying language doesn't necessarily determine the quality of your study. Spending three hours a day watching movies doesn't help you learn much if you're not actively engaging with the language. In this video, we'll talk about three ways to actively engage your mind while studying a new language. Number one, think of your brain as a muscle. You're probably familiar with the phrase, feel the burn, or maybe no pain, no gain. If you've been to your local gym recently, there's a chance you might have heard one of these phrases or seen them plastered on a wall. There's an idea in the world of sports and workouts that the discomfort you feel when running, pumping iron, or doing some other physical activity is what brings results. During a healthy workout, the muscles of the body are affected at a microscopic level. The discomfort you feel is your muscles being pushed to their limit. It's the limit pushing that strengthens your muscles so that over time, your performance increases. In the context of language learning, it's helpful to think of your brain as a muscle. Just as we need to push our physical limits when exercising, we also need to push our mental limits when learning a foreign language. Have you ever studied or practiced your target language in a way that left you tired or even exhausted? If so, you've experienced what it's like to push your brain out of its linguistic comfort zone. Number two, practice active listening. One of the easiest ways to push your language skills is to practice active listening. Active listening is when you listen to someone speaking your target language and you do your best to understand what you hear. The best way to accomplish this is by using audio that you can't completely understand on the first listen. Preferably, you want to use audio that has subtitles or transcripts for you to double check your understanding after you listen to it. You can use movies, YouTube clips, or even our language program, which has very useful transcripts for each lesson. During a practice session, you should listen to the audio several times. The first time around, it's okay if little to no words stick out to you. Simply make a mental note of any words or sounds you recognize. The second time you listen, you're likely to recognize a little more than you did the previous time. Expect similar results with your third or even fourth time listening. After you've hit the ceiling of words you can decipher, go ahead and look at the language subtitles or transcripts. Listen to the audio again, reading along with the text. Odds are that you will see words in the text you know, but didn't hear correctly. You're also likely to encounter words that are new to you completely. As you play back the audio and read along, try to guess what these words mean from the context of the words around them. After you've read along a couple times, feel free to look up the remaining unfamiliar words in a dictionary or translator app. This active listening exercise routine is a great way to increase your listening and comprehension skills while picking up some new vocabulary along the way. It also allows you to learn new words in context, which itself is a powerful method to help you retain what you study. Number three, practicing with native speakers. Practicing with native speakers is the epitome of pushing your language skills. Using what you know to communicate in real time is where the rubber really meets the road. Try to connect with a native speaker on a weekly basis. Regularity is what makes the difference when you're learning a foreign language. If you live in a large metropolitan area, then there's a significant chance that there are some local native speakers nearby. Try hitting up a local language exchange or meetup group to make the necessary connections. If you're unable to find a practice partner locally, then you can take your search online. There are a number of sites out there that help you find and connect with other language learners from around the world. There are tons of language learners around the world who have learned or are learning a second language. You're likely to find someone who knows your target language and is looking to improve their own language skills as well. Learning a new language isn't always easy, but it's the discomfort that comes with pushing your ability in the language that produces results in your studies. Don't be afraid to step outside of your comfort zone. The further away you get from your native language, the closer you'll be to attaining fluency. Also remember that language learning is in every way a lot like an adventure. There will be fun times and times when it feels like you're swimming up the proverbial stream. 
It's by keeping your head up long enough through these ups and downs that you will experience the priceless satisfaction that comes from learning a foreign language. Just keep moving forward. Let's be honest, it's difficult to learn a new language. If you're new to a language, it's going to take consistent and concentrated effort to start using the language fluently. However, this fact shouldn't discourage you. While learning a new language is hard, it's far from impossible. In this video, we'll outline five tips you can use to jumpstart your language learning. Follow these pointers to learn your target language in a way that is efficient and effective. Number one, limit your native language use when practicing. The idea here is that when you practice with native speakers, you do your best to refrain from using your native language. This is generally harder the less you know, but if you can manage to stick to this rule, you'll reap some huge rewards. If you commit to a no native language practice session, it's not going to be easy. Most likely, there will be some frustrating, if not painstakingly difficult moments where you either have trouble understanding the person you're talking to or you can't say what you want to say. It's precisely in these moments that your language learning muscles are built up to capacity. The process really isn't all that different from working out in the gym. Just replace the physical burn of lifting weights for the mental burn of thinking in a new language. In the end, if there's no pain, there's no gain. Obviously, this no native language rule doesn't have to be written in stone. There are times when it's more beneficial to break out of the target language box and have something explained to you in your native language. However, this should definitely be the exception rather than the standard. Number two, have set times to practice speaking throughout the week. Now that we've discussed a good way to practice speaking, let's delve a bit into when to speak. One of the best commitments you can keep while learning a new language is to set aside specific times to practice speaking the language on a weekly basis. Ideally, these speaking sessions are on set days at specific times and form part of your weekly routine. If you don't make it a point to set aside specific practice times, you run the risk of your language practice falling through the cracks of your busy schedule. I recommend writing down your practice times and hanging it somewhere you can always see it. You could also input the times into your phone and set an alarm. The point is to remind yourself of your commitment every day so that it doesn't fall by the wayside. Number three, get picky about vocabulary. Whether you practice with a podcast, a friend at a coffee shop, or a teacher, you're going to run into a flood of new and unfamiliar vocabulary. Despite your best efforts, it's unlikely that you'll be able to pin down every new word or phrase you hear and study it later. Thus, you should pick and choose which new words you focus on. The defining quality of each new word you learn should be its practicality. The more useful a word or phrase is to you in a conversation, the more important it is that you learn it. Don't feel like you have to cram the entirety of your target language into one week of study. Take it one step at a time. A few practical words here, some more there. Before you know it, you'll see your vocabulary improve. Number four, write and practice short monologues. This tip can be a lot of fun. Begin by selecting a topic you enjoy discussing. Then, simply write out a short monologue or speech on the subject in your target language. The first thing you'll notice while doing this will likely be the holes in your grammar and vocabulary. But when you try to write out your thoughts in a foreign language, you might inevitably hit roadblocks. You might not be able to think of a word or know how to formulate a specific idea or opinion yet. This can be great because these holes are the exact areas where you should focus your studies. You can bring up these problem areas in your next lesson or browse through your favorite language course or textbook in order to find the answer. The constant process of finding these language holes and filling them is what keeps you moving along the path to fluency. Once you finish your short text, it's a great idea to practice reciting it or even memorizing it. The memorization will help you internalize the new grammar and vocabulary you've learned. Reciting it will get your tongue and mouth used to the sounds. Number five, keep an up-to-date list on what you want to learn. Throughout your studies, you should always have a sort of language shopping list. As you practice and study, you will most likely come across things you'd like to be able to say, but don't know how to yet, especially if you follow our previous tip. Write this wish list down. It's one thing to learn the vocabulary you pick up via a course or podcast, both of which are great. It's a bit different when your vocabulary gets personal. Learn the words that matter to you, either because they're practical or because you simply find them interesting. The more relevant the vocabulary, the more likely you are to retain it. 
Some people might tell you it's impossible to learn a new language for whatever reason, but it's important to remember that the way you study and engage with a language greatly affects how quickly or effectively you learn it. Being able to speak freely with native speakers is an amazing ability in itself, but being able to speak freely to a whole new group of people opens you up to possible new relationships. Most people don't realize that spending the time to build relationships in a foreign language can actually help you improve your language skills dramatically. In this video, we look at how making relationships in a foreign language can help you learn the language faster. The benefits of having friends and partners who speak a foreign language. First, it's motivational. One of the greatest struggles for anyone learning a second language is motivation. Nine times out of 10, learners start out their language learning journey with loads of enthusiasm, only to see it gradually wane over time. Try as they may, it's difficult to maintain the spark they once shared with their new language. So why not borrow energy from a different part of your life? When you make relationships with people in your target language, all the excitement of a new relationship carries directly over into your learning. Suddenly, you have a very rewarding reason to improve your skills and keep practicing. As your partner or your friends get involved, you will also have the advantage of a constant source of support and encouragement. Second, it makes language learning practical. Studying vocabulary and grammar is a vital part of language learning, whether you use a podcast, textbook, app, or find yourself in a classroom. However, as great as studying is, a language really only starts to come alive once you start using it in everyday life. There's a huge difference between a scripted conversation in a lesson plan and a real-life conversation with a native speaker. Building relationships with native speakers will give you the chance to talk in your target language often. Furthermore, it will be in a way that feels natural. You'll learn the words in the context, which is hugely important. Third, it's fun. One of the greatest benefits is that it allows you to practice without having it feel like practice. Oftentimes, you'll find yourself so wrapped up in the conversation that you forget you're using a foreign language. This takes a lot of the pressure off and helps you focus on communication over trying to speak absolutely perfectly. You also get to learn about a whole new culture from your partner or friends. So you're not only learning language skills, but also about the cultures that surround your target language. The risks of having friends and partners who speak a foreign language. First, it's easy to miscommunicate. When it comes to relationships, humans can easily misunderstand each other. So it can be hard when building relationships in your target language when you or your partner's lack of ability in each other's respective native tongue can lead to miscommunications that would otherwise be avoidable. Depending on the language you're speaking, a simple mistranslation or mispronounced word can drastically change the meaning of a sentence. As long as you can afford each other some extra patience and the benefit of the doubt, then you should be able to overcome this pitfall. Second, your language skills could suffer if your relationships don't work out. If all your language practice is wrapped up in one person and your relationship with that person doesn't work out, then your language learning could take a big hit. So it's best not to put all your hopes for language growth on one area, relationship or otherwise. You don't want to risk losing motivation, so try to find it in many different areas. An idea for building relationships in a foreign language. Make games out of getting to know one another. Sometimes, opening up in any new friendship or partnership can be hard. Add in the added struggle of a new language and it can feel impossible to share your true feelings with others. So instead of trying to take first interactions so seriously and talking about the usual things like the weather or work, try to ask new, interesting questions. Try to figure out what the other person's hobbies are without asking directly, or what kind of job they have. This will give you a chance to stretch your language skills in a new way, and you'll probably get some funny answers out of it too. Being comfortable being silly or making language mistakes is a great way to bond with someone, even if you've just met. Relationships in a foreign language have a lot more benefits to offer than drawbacks. Don't be scared to open up to people and make mistakes. Hey everyone, welcome to The Monthly Review, the monthly show on language learning. How to finally learn language in 2020, your New Year's resolution solution. Today, you're going to learn, one, three reasons most goals fail, two, the three rules for successful goal setting, and three, we're going to set you up with your first language goal for 2020. So, if you've failed with your goals or New Year's resolutions before, then this lesson is for you. 
you'll be able to finally learn your target language, make measurable progress, and reach every goal you set. But first, listen up. Here are this month's new lessons and resources. First, the making a phone call cheat sheet. Want to be able to talk on the phone in your target language? Then this conversation cheat sheet will help you do just that. You'll learn all the basic phrases, questions, and answers you'll need when making a phone call. Second, want to know the learning hacks, motivational tips, and success strategies for learning a language in 2020? Then you'll want this exclusive 52-page ebook. Download it now for free before we take it down. Third, words and phrases for the dentist. Learn how to schedule a checkup, talk about a toothache, and much more with this one-minute vocab lesson. Fourth, can you talk about your zodiac sign? If not, then this next one-minute lesson is for you. You'll learn how to say the 12 signs in your target language. Fifth, the 32 words you need for language learning. Noun, verb, adjective, sentence, grammar. Can you say these in your target language? If not, you'll want this quick one-minute lesson. To get your free resources, click the link in the description below right now. They're yours to keep forever. Okay, let's jump into today's topic. How to finally learn language in 2020, your New Year's resolution solution. So, January is over, but let me ask you a question. Have you set a resolution for this year? If you haven't, it's understandable. Most people end up failing with their resolutions. You set one, you try to do it in January, and by February, there's no progress. Doing it is no longer fun, or you get sidelined by something else. So you quit and put it off until next year, or whenever the guilt of quitting your goals comes back to haunt you. So what's the problem with setting resolutions? Why do we keep failing? First of all, regardless of what most people say about New Year's resolutions, setting goals, whether on January 1st or any other time of the year, is a good thing. You have to know where you're going and what you want to achieve. Otherwise, you'll be floating around aimlessly from one language app to another and have nothing to show for your time spent. But the problem lies with the goals that people set. For example, most people set goals like, I want to master Chinese, or I want to lose weight, or I want to be fluent in Japanese. And based on these kinds of goals, here are three reasons why 90% of New Year's resolutions fail. First, resolutions fail because they are not specific and not measurable. Take a goal like, I want to master Chinese this year. The problem is that's a very vague goal. What do you mean by master? Do you want to speak about the economy or do you just want to have everyday conversations? And can you really measure how much progress you need to master the language? The second reason is, they are unrealistic. You might think, but isn't it good to set huge goals and aim for the stars? It's not bad, but if you say, I want to be fluent by September, is that realistic for you? Are you ready to commit yourself to nothing but language learning, six to eight hours a day, nonstop? The answer is no for most people. The third one is, there's no action plan. The problem is, you'll still fail even with a specific and realistic goal if you don't know when and how you're going to do it. For example, when will you study? How long will you study every day? And how will you study? So now you know why most people fail with their New Year's resolutions. Then how do we set New Year's resolutions and actually succeed? Here are the three rules for successful goal setting. Remember, your goals must be one, specific and measurable, two, realistic, and three, they must have an action plan. Yes, the complete opposite of everything you heard earlier. For example, let's say you're learning Italian this year. Instead of saying, my goal is to learn Italian this year, set a specific, measurable, realistic goal for the month, like speak three minutes of conversation by February 28th. And you can also set a yearly goal, like 30 minutes of conversation, and work towards that. The whole point is, three minutes is measurable. You set a timer, time yourself, and know when you reach it. It's realistic. Instead of saying, I want to learn the whole language, you're just aiming for three minutes for the month and maybe 30 minutes for the year. So ask yourself, do I have time to learn enough of the language to speak for three minutes? That will vary from learner to learner, but three minutes sounds much more realistic than I want to master a language. Finally, you still need an action plan for your goal. And for that, you need to answer these questions. When will you study? How long will you study every day? Where do you plan to study? How will you study? What is your study schedule? This is the most important part because this tells you when and how to study. 
If you don't answer these questions, you'll have no idea what to do and you'll quit because you have no routine to stick to. So for example, when will you study? I'll study at 9 p.m. on weekdays. How long will you study every day? I'll study for 20 minutes. Where do you plan to study? I'll study at home, in the living room, on my computer. How will you study? I'll listen to one audio lesson a day for five days. What is your study schedule? From Monday to Friday with audio lessons. I'll listen to the lesson, then go through the lesson notes for 20 minutes each day. Here are a few more things you can do to improve your chances of success. Reward yourself after hitting a goal. Studies have shown that giving yourself a reward after reaching a goal is crucial to creating lasting habits and continuing to conquer more goals. Write down your small measurable goal and put it somewhere you'll see it often. Now that you know why New Year's resolutions fail and you know what to do differently, it's time to set your goal. So thank you for watching this episode of Monthly Review. See you next time, bye. Great work, here's a reward. Speed up your language learning with our PDF lessons. Get all of our best PDF cheat sheets and eBooks for free. Just click the link in the description.